But if you don't like it, you still come back next week when I'm gone. Because uh, I won't be here again next week. So, My family's here with me today. We are missionaries with In Faith, as uh, Pastor Jeff said. We have been working uh, with Ford Bible Camp and some of the local Bible studies for the last 12 years. And um, are just loving what God's doing on the Georgetown Divide. And your church has supported us the whole time. So I want to thank you guys for that support. Um, one thing I, I want to start off with my family, I thought it was interesting because normally the kids are in, like our church has the children's church from the get-go, you know, we drop them off and then we go into the service and uh, I didn't realize how charismatic my baby was. That's, <laughs> like, oh, he's, he's right there in that thing. He, uh, the baby, so Oliver, he's our youngest, he's our Christmas baby, he was born on Christmas 2015, that was a surprise, he was supposed to come in January. And um, he, he loves praying. So as soon as, if we're praying for a meal or whatever, he's not okay with someone else praying without him getting a prayer. And he, he only knows like three words. So like this morning at breakfast, he prayed for mama, dada, which is the car. Um, so we appreciate him praying for the car with all the traveling that we do. And then uh, I, have, I have Connor. And he's a very compassionate, sweet uh, little boy. And he, uh, Connor with a K, because we like to confuse people. <laughs> but he, he uh, this morning, spilled orange juice. And he wasn't okay uh, until he knew that he was forgiven by Grandma Jan. So <laughs> he wanted to make, you know, he had to make sure that, that he was forgiven. He's very sweet. Uh, Madeline, she's my only girl. She's my princess. And she loves girly things. And then Ian. He's the one in here, and uh, he actually loves uh, like apologetics and, and creation studies. And he uh, happens to be going. We take him down to a, an Awana club. That's it's a, it's 45 minutes from our house, so it's a ways. But uh, we're committed to go regularly, and uh, his his leaders are real into Genesis apologetics, and he just eats that up and loves it. And anyway, um, my wife Carissa, she uh, she's right there alongside me, and uh, she's. She helps me with everything along the way, and she's uh, pulled out of more camp things over the last year, um, over the last several years. We've been trying to get her out of more and more camp things, uh, which is definitely full time as soon as you're in any of it, and uh, to, to let her focus on you know the kids more and, and all of that. So she uh, homeschools our kids as well. I love camp. I love that ministry. Uh, we do other some other ministries like right now we're doing a weekly Bible study at the local high school. I'm going to talk a little about that later. But uh, camp is definitely where my heart is at. I'm, I'm in ministry today because of a camp that I served at in 2004. I had served a couple different summers here and there at this camp in New Mexico. And uh, in 2004, I went to serve for a full summer. And I, I loved seeing what God was doing in the hearts of young people. It would be amazing to me that, that kids would come in. Uh, it was every week. They would come in Monday and they would leave Saturday. And it was consistent to see kids' lives changed um, to go from fear of, because uh, a lot of them are Navajo kids, and so to go from fear of Navajo religion and, and skinwalkers and, and demonic things to leaving with the faith in Jesus and no longer afraid of those things. And I loved seeing that. I was like, man, I want to do this the rest of my life. So I went to Bible college, met my wife, and she happened to want to do camp ministry as well. So uh, God worked in that and brought us together, and here we are 12 years later, uh, still at, at Ford Bible Camp, we live there, and uh, working in the community and some of those other things. I want to pray, um, and then we'll dig into the, to the scripture here. God, I thank you that I could be here uh, at Big Trees this morning. I thank you for uh, just the faithful servants here that are uh, providing for the ministry that we're a part of, that they are so faithful to the in-faith missionaries and provide so well for, the, for us and the others. God, I pray that you bless this morning. I pray that uh, you'd be with us as we look at uh, Christ talking to the woman at the well, that we would get something out of this for our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. God loves camp too. They were talking about that. I just got back from a conference called 3CA, uh, Christian Camp and Conference Association. And I, I happen to really appreciate what they do because it so points exactly to, to what I'm, you know, to where I'm at, at a camp. And uh, we have in-faith conferences, and, and they talk about you know, missions and stuff. 
Is that is my kid running away? <laughs> but the three CA conference is is so uh, direct to camping, and they were talking about how uh, camp is such a vital uh, ministry, and and how God loves camp, and, and the uh, the new director of our section. Um, Bedford Homes from Zephyr Point. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's a beautiful camp. Anyway, he said God loves camp. When, when his people, the Israelites, when he took them out of Egypt, he took them on a 40-year camping trip. And uh, most of them died. So that's, in one way, it wasn't the best camping trip. Uh, our goal is zero deaths every year. But uh, I thought that was hilarious and camping. Okay, so we're going to be in John chapter 4, so you guys can start turning there. And I want to talk about needs. John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 7 while you're turning there. Needs. In my house, my kids talk about things they need, right? Maybe, you've, maybe you uh, have done this too, but there's things that my kids, you know, they need. Things they, they, they think they have to have that aren't technically needs. We would say those aren't needs. And sometimes it's... Uh, video game time, yeah. or a tablet or a phone, which isn't happening, the phone thing, not going to happen again, sorry. Um, sometimes it's outside playtime when they're supposed to do schoolwork, right? Or something, uh, remote control, or candy, that's one thing my baby is like super, if, because I'm, I'm a snack kind of guy, um, you could probably tell that by looking at me, but I'm a snack kind of guy, and my baby, uh, too, if he sees me get a snack, or anyone else get a snack, he has to have one. Like, you can't get one in front of him. And, and so he's kind of my little accountability partner there. Or water at bedtime. We're going to talk about water today and the need for water, but uh, it always seems at bedtime. Yeah. Like, they can go all day without asking for water, but they die of thirst right at bedtime. There's just <laughs> something about the pillow dehydrates them completely. <laughs> As adults, we, we have different things that we need to. Maybe it's some of the things on the kids' list. Uh, the, the things that I think stands out for them. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's something else. Maybe like in my case, uh, I've got four kids, so noise canceling headphones. I would really like a good pair of noise canceling <laughs> headphones. Uh, or maybe uh, some you know I like mountain biking, a new mountain bike. I've got one that works, but I need a different one, right? Um, different cars, different houses, whatever. We we have these things that we think we need. And here, in John chapter 4, we're going to look at a woman who has an actual need and then also learns of something else that she needs that she had no idea. So, um, here we go. A woman from, John chapter 4, verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And we're going to stop right there. So she came to draw water. Here she is. Uh, it's about noon. It says it's the sixth hour. So here she is about noon, and she's here to draw water. She needed water. This isn't a want, right? We have to have water. Uh, she's there. Recently, we had, uh, we're, the camp was remodeling our house. The bathroom that was, uh, it was in need of re repair. And they, uh, Mitch, or my father-in-law, one of the, you support Mitch. And he, uh, he's a contractor by trade. So he was gonna, he, he helped, he was starting to tear stuff out. And we had to shut off the water. We were without water for a week. And uh, you can't live there without water for a week. It's just, it's not possible. So we were living in the Harmony House, which has no kitchen, and our house, which, which has a kitchen, and trying to figure out water. And, and it's hard because you can't do dishes. It's hard to cook without water. So it makes things extremely difficult. Um, we, we have to have water. We have to have water to clean. Um, water is super important. And, and we definitely realize how important it is when we don't have it. A friend of ours recently had a water a pipe break from the freezing. Uh, with all the cold weather and snow and stuff, and there's probably some in here that have had a pipe break. And uh, she said that they, the one thing they noticed was throughout the day they would go and turn on faucets and be like, oh yeah, that's right, no water. Or they'd go and flush to try to flush a toilet and be like, oh yeah, no water, right? And we realize the importance of this water more as we need it. It's, it's one of those things in our culture where it's so easy to get. Normally, you know, with that turn of the faucet, you've got nice, clear drinking water. Um, flush the toilet, it's, it's there. You don't even notice that it happens. Um, so here we are. Uh, she comes to draw water. And verse 7, the end of verse 7 there. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. 
For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where are you getting that water, that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty, or have to come here and draw water. So the woman here, after this conversation, this point in the conversation, doesn't understand what's going on. And Ian, Ian says, because I, I went through this with my kids to see where they were at on, on the understanding of this. And I read that. And at the end of that, but without asking anything, my daughter, who's six, goes, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get it. She, she doesn't understand. Uh, she still thinks he's talking about actual physical water, right? Um, she's like, yeah, hey, I don't got to come back here. I don't got to come deal with this drawing water. I, I don't have to come back here in the heat of the day so that I don't have to talk to anybody, which we'll get to why she doesn't want to talk to anybody in a little bit. But um, she, she's thinking, this is great. Endless water. Don't got to go to the well. Don't got to walk over here. Don't got to walk it back. Don't have to draw it. Um, so she's looking forward to this uh, physical water that she thinks Jesus is talking about. Um, what Jesus is actually offering is salvation through him. He's offering a relationship with God and freedom from sin. We often don't understand either this importance, uh, this spiritual need compared to water. He's comparing it to water because it's something we have to have. In survival, it's, it's number one, right? Um, depending on the, the weather and stuff, if it's scorching hot, you actually need shelter first because you lose more water being out in the elements. But there's, for the most part, it's water. And, and the reason that it could be some other thing, like shelter, is really just to preserve the water that's already inside of you. So it, it comes down to we have to have water. And uh, Jesus is saying that our spiritual need is as important as that water. Now, I think it's interesting the way God provides in, in unexpected ways, like for this woman, she came to this well expecting to get physical water and was learning about the living water that Jesus offered. Recently, at that conference that I was at, we had a speaker, a guy that I'd never heard of before, um, named Steve Carter. Come to find out he's like a famous preacher, but <laughs> I hadn't heard of him yet. Anyway, um, he... Uh, he was talking the first night, and going in, I, I had, uh, I've got a lot going on. I'm trying to get uh, stuff ready for camp and, and get my lessons ready for the summer so that I can give them to our speakers. And so I'm, I'm just thinking about all these different things, and I'm thinking about this woman at the well. And I'm, I've, I've got a page up on my phone while we're getting ready for chapel. I've got like 20 minutes before he comes up and speaks, and I find this, this great article on this woman at the well. And so I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, bookmark this, save it for after, because there's no way I'm going to get through it all in time. Anyway, so I'm thinking about this woman at the well. And uh, he gets up, and in his sermon, he says that he was in Bethlehem, on an actually, actually in Bethlehem, the speaker was there. And um, he, uh, see, I, I haven't been to Bethlehem myself, but I guess, uh, you know, the, the Palestinians and the, the Jewish, the, the Israelites, Israel, they, they're, you know, they're fighting over the Gaza Strip, and they, they want, like, the same land, and uh, so there's both soldiers at this one part of the city, and he explains that he's there, and he's trying to go to internet. He, he wants to go to this cafe, or it's a, he said it was a, a like a hookah lounge that has inter free internet, so he's trying to go over to this hookah lounge for the free internet, and he's thinking, internet, 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 I want to go for the internet. And he goes, and uh, walking over there, he sees these three Palestinian soldiers. And he feels that God's telling him to talk to these three guys. And he's like, that seems more dangerous than I'd like to do. I really just want internet. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't know what to say. What if they don't speak English? So he goes and he talks to them, and, and sure enough, they speak English. And he says, are you, are you guys from here? Are you guys from Bethlehem? Where are you guys from? And they said, and I, I wrote down a couple details, because like I said, I'm not familiar with the area. But, um... 
He said they were from, two of them were from uh, Balada, which is a UN refugee camp. I'd heard of the camp before. Anyway, but I guess it's a UN refugee camp. Uh, it has 35,000 people on a 1.35 square mile area. So it's tons of people. He said you work, you work between where they're living and, and the different sites, and you're like squeezing between things. Anyway, so two of them are from that. And he was supposed to do a tour of that camp with his, with his group the next day. And so he says, hey, would you guys mind you know, giving, my, giving my, my group a tour of that place? And they said, sure, we'd love to, you know? So they plan a meetup, he meets up with them, they show him around the camp, and he goes, hey, have you guys been to that church that's on the, you know, just outside this camp? Um, he's like, it's, it's pretty interesting. And, and they said, no, we've, we've never been to this church. And um, so he goes and he takes the, the, the Palestinian guys, the guards, into this church. And at the bottom of the church is this well. The Samaritan well is still, it's still there. They've built a church over the top of it. And he shows them this well, and he asks them um, what they want most in life. And they said, peace. And um, he said that, he was explained to them the, the passage of Jesus and this woman, and how they can have that peace with Jesus. And he led two Palestinian guards to Jesus at this, at this well in modern day, um, right there outside the, the UN refugee camp. Um, and I was like, what? Like, what a crazy story. And then like, as I'm, and I, I walked up to him afterwards, I'm like, all right, I need more details on this story. This is amazing um, that, that God provided for, well, originally the Samaritan woman, and then in modern times, he provided for those Palestinian guys, you, right? And you were willing to share with them. And then here, I get to talk about it this morning. And I'm excited because I couldn't believe it came up like that. It was just a shocker to me, right? And it's just amazing how God provides. And in this, in this way, he's talking to this woman. And he's providing for her whether she understands it yet or not. And she's about to. So here we are in John chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, this interaction, just like most interactions with Jesus in the New Testament, are very unique. Um, but this one, I, I find so many things, and I'm reading it every time, I'm like, this is so, like, the way Jesus says things, the way people respond is so different than, than normal, at least uh, from my <coughs> Western thinking. Um, first, he knows exactly her past, because he said, he has it, he tells her, the one, when she says, I have no husband, he says, you're right, you've had five, right? And the one you're with isn't your husband. So he knows that, but he doesn't start there. He starts with, go, go call your husband and bring him here. Because his goal isn't to call her out on her sin. His goal is to get her to think about her sin. For her to come to the point where she realizes she's sinned and needs a savior. And I think that's amazing. That's just, it's, it's interesting. And uh, I love it. So this interaction is interesting. Um, her response, I have no husband. Uh, in, one of my, in one of the commentaries I was reading, it said, this is the shortest response she has. Her response of, I have no husband. Throughout the conversation, it's a pretty good conversation. Back and forth, Jesus says something, she has a pretty good reply. At this one, she's like, uh, I have no husband. Right? It's just a quick little, let's move on to a different topic, you know. Um, and then when he says what he says, you've had five and all that. She says, uh, sir, I think I'm perceiving you're a prophet, right? I'm starting, to, I'm starting to see you in a different light. I'm starting to think you're something different than what I thought. I thought you were a teacher, now I'm thinking prophet. And then she starts to talk about where her people worship and where his people worship. And this is interesting because she's changing the subject. She's moving on to something else. She's moving on to something else that she thinks will bring up an argument, which is better than talking about her own sin. Right? Because uh, there's comedians I've heard that talk about how people don't want to talk about religion. Right? That's like the last thing people want to talk about. Um, but I think the last thing would actually be our own sin, right? So religion's pretty high up there. If you don't want to talk about that, or people generally don't want to talk about that, 
if you, since you're here, I'm guessing it's not as high on the list for us, but most people <laughs> don't want to talk about religion. But talking about our sin, that's, that's a little higher on the list. So here she's like, uh, your father's worshipped on this mountain. We think it's over here. What do you think about that, you know? <laughs> and Jesus goes on, verse 21. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now it's here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. But the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So here we have Jesus who says, it's not about that mountain or this mountain. And then really he gets to the point of, it's about me, Jesus. It's about believing him. And she even knows, she's heard that the Messiah is coming. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Um, John Piper had some interesting points on this, on his use of the Father, because she doesn't bring up uh, talking to God, the Father. She says that our fathers worshipped on this mountain, which, and he mentions, he, he ties that into God the Father. Um, God the Father is the Father we should care about, is what he's saying. We can be children of God if we believe on the Son, and this is the goal of Jesus' conversation with this woman. So he's bringing that around. Tying it all together. John 4.27 says this. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you see, or What are you talking with her? Why are you talking with her? Uh, sometimes we get in a situation where we, we don't know exactly what's going on. They come in this situation and they've got their, their teacher talking to a Samaritan woman. Which was a few no-nos in their culture. Because one, she was a Samaritan and two, she was a woman. <laughs> So they're thinking this is odd, and I think, I think this is neat of the disciples because often in the New Testament they're quick to say what they shouldn't and quick to do what they shouldn't, right? We see uh, some, some kind of rashness. Um, one of the sessions at the conference I was just at was all about, you know, we're, we're quick to cut off the ear, right? Um, and, and so we see, the, we see the disciples here actually showing some restraint in their conversation. They're not asking Jesus yet. They're like... You know, I think if I sit around and, and wait, I'm going to see what's going on here, as opposed to just asking, why are you talking to this woman, right? Um, I think in, in our culture, it's gotten so easy to just be rash and say what we're thinking. The internet makes that very hard. Um, I, was, I, was, I saw this list in one of the seminars I was at. And they have a list of skills to success in the 21st century. So these are things that, uh, not just you know, in church, but in business in general, in life, some skills that we want our kids to have, that we want our next generation to have, to help them in life and business and things. And they included um, oral communication, teamwork, social competence, leadership, self-direction, self-management, critical thinking, Creativity and ethics. And as we think about those things, we think God's Word teaches a lot of those. And life skills, and uh, as th things come up in our lives, we learn those things. But really, we would lo love for our kids. I know I'd love for my kids to have you know, high skills in each of those. Um, the Internet seems to do the opposite for several of those, right? Uh, the quick to, quick to react, quick to say things we shouldn't. Um, it, it, lately, the whole the divide seems like it's growing with the you know the gun debates and the the liberal conservative debates and things. And uh, like I just saw a friend was a uh, friend had posted something pro gun and someone else had told them to put their gun in their mouth and and it was like whoa people this is escalating so fast like this is so negative right and there's so much negativity online and and uh, the disciples here they don't walk up and ask in this case. I think this is a good example uh, to follow, a good example to be a little slower to speak. We see that uh, in verses like James 1.19 and Proverbs 17.28, which teach us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And that includes typing, slow to type. They didn't have keyboards back then, but quick to listen, slow to type. Or type right now. Yeah. 
Um, like I said, I think the internet makes that hard. And we, we can be a good example by, by, being a, by being a good example online as well. Uh, the disciples decided to hold their tongues. In the same way, we, uh, we do things with that, like with the internet. We often do things that drain people. We're talking about this living water in verse 14. It said, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And rather than filling people's cup, sometimes we're the ones that drain people's cup. And we're supposed to be a spring of water welling up, not the ones stabbing holes in the bottom of their cup, right? We're supposed to be filling that cup. Uh, what is a spring? Let's see, we have kids in here today. Did mine leave? Oh, wake up, Ian. <laughs> what it, what it, uh, can, so one of the kids, tell me what a spring is. What is a spring? There's two. So maybe you can tell me what one of the two is. I see your hand, you know, just waiting to see what else. <laughs> tell me what the one is that this isn't talking about, Ian. Like a spring that comes from a water source and just... Oh, okay, you're talking about the water. Okay, what is that spring? Go ahead. A spring that comes from a water source and just... And, like, gives it to you. Just gives what to you? Water. Water just comes up, huh? Yeah. We have a spring at camp. On the lower part of the property, there's a natural spring, and uh, it dries up in the summer, but in the wintertime, water just comes out of the ground. At some point, someone stuck a pipe in the ground. I'm not sure why they, that happens, but why they would do that, but they stuck a pipe, and it just comes out of the pipe there. Um, and it's a natural occurring spring. You don't have to pump it. We don't have to pay for a pump. It automatically comes out of the ground. The other kind is the kind like you compress a spring, you know, like a, you have an, even a pen. If you take apart a pen, there's a spring, you know, compress it and it comes back. Okay, a spring that like we're talking is a water spring, and it just comes out of the ground naturally. And that's how we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus. Good things, nice things, the nice things that, that we say, those things are supposed to just come out of us, well out of us naturally, like a, like a spring with water coming out. Oftentimes, uh, natural springs are really, they're, they're known for being delicious. It's really clear, clean water, except for whatever they bottle from Crystal Geyser. That's disgusting. But <laughs> normally, <laughs> normally, water springs are, are great. Um, natural springs. They're supposed to be good, 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 delicious water. Um, a spring often looks like us telling others what God is doing in our lives. God is doing stuff in your life. Sometimes we don't, we don't notice it, we don't write it down, we don't tell other people about it, but God is doing stuff in our lives. Uh, the, the speaker at the conference encouraged us to think about the last week. Not think about the things God did several years ago, but in the last week, what has God done in your life? Because he's doing things right now and we often uh, miss those because we're thinking about some big thing in the past, or maybe not even thinking about what God's doing in our lives. But let's, uh, I'm going to just read a verse here. Uh, Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive my power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We, if you've been in church a lot, you, you've heard this, these, this verse, and we've talked about these places, Right? Um, and we often think of them as geographically, not, not, not like we need to be going just to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, um, but geographically like your local place is, is Jerusalem, right? And then Judea would be the next closest area. And it's um, one thing that this is talking about also is, is like your comfort level, basically, because Jerusalem is the place you're comfortable with. It's the people that live in places like you, talk like you, have the same mannerisms, like the same TV shows, you know, um, they're similar politically, like, <laughs> you know, um, they, they are similar, they have a lot in common. Judea is the next closest. They look like you, they have some similarities, um, they uh, talk and communicate like you, there might be a few differences, right? As we get further down into Samaria and the end of the earth, we start to get those that are 
Samaria, the, the Jewish people looked down on the Samaritans. Um, that's why one of the reasons why it was so odd for the disciples to see Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman was because they looked down on them. They were half-breeds. They were people that they, they despised. And uh, not only that, they twisted what they believed, and they worshipped on a different mountain, right? So they, uh, they were different religious, and they were different... Um, they looked down on them because they, they looked at them as half-breeds. And um, for us, you know, that might be someone who thinks different than us politically or someone who uh, has a different way of, of, of doing things or, or uh, the, the charismatic baby in the back, right? Uh, <laughs> it might be a variety of things, but it's definitely someone um, that we look down on in some way. And what... Whether I like to admit it or not, there are people that I look down on in some way. I may not like think they're the scum of the earth and don't deserve Jesus, but there are people that I look down on because they think different than me. And so we're supposed to be reaching those, those Samaritans. And then the end of the earth is uh, areas that are completely different, right? Areas, you know, people that we would have to learn a different language to talk to or uh, travel to a different country right now where the Hatfields are at. That would be the ends of the earth, right? Um, completely different. Are we reaching out to people? I was looking up and I found a 2012 survey, which is starting to get old, but it's, I'm sure the numbers are probably worse now. A survey of almost 3,000 Protestant Christians. It said, 80% uh, said uh, it was their personal responsibility to share their religious beliefs about Jesus with non-Christians. That leaves 20% that think they're not supposed to share Jesus with others. Thought that was kind of sad, but then it gets, it seems to get worse. 61% uh, hadn't shared the gospel with anyone in the last six months. 48% hadn't invited someone to a church service or program in the last six months. And 20% said they rarely or never prayed for unbelieving friends and family. And I'm thinking, wow, like, and how often do I, am I that person too? Like, I was thinking, looking at my prayer list, um, I started adding people, but it's, I was looking at my prayer list maybe two months ago and thinking, wow, I don't have anyone I'm praying for that's unsaved. And I know I have family that are unsaved that I'm not praying for. So I was, I was part of that, right? And I, I want to be praying for those unsaved family members. I want to be praying for those unsaved friends that don't know Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. And I share these um, so that you guys, along with myself, so we can correct some things. So we can, we can leave this service and be praying for those people and be sharing Jesus, be ready to share our faith with those people. Um, and like I said, I recently started adding some of those people to my prayer list. Uh, I was prayer journaling. I think prayer journaling is great because you get to see uh, what, how God's answering. Because we often forget a prayer request we've had. You know, uh, if... Grandma Jan didn't come to service today and, and remind you, you might have forgotten, oh yeah, that's right, I prayed for her when she was sick last week. And so now, since she's here, we can see she's feeling great. She told me this morning she's feeling great. Um, we can praise God that he, that he worked in her and healed her and got her back here with us. Um, so a prayer journal is great. And I switched to, a, to an app. Um, <coughs> It's kind of, I, I think it's kind of funny that there's an app on prayer, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so the reason I like the app, just so you guys, it's called Echo, and our pastor recommended it. Uh, I'll explain in a second why I think it's so funny and kind of distracting. But uh, the thing I like about it is I have my phone with me all the time. You know, I, uh, I get my work emails with camp and all kinds of different things on my device, and so I've got it with me all the time. And so it's easy to have with me. You know, whether I'm home, whether I'm abroad, I can pull up my prayer app and see what I need, what I need to be talking to God about. And then I can see as they come up again, I can see, uh, you know, answered prayer. The reason I think it's funny is because in that list of things uh, earlier that I mentioned, the traits, the skills that we want our kids to have, the important, you know, uh, the leadership and social communication and things, they found that uh, at the seminar I went to, they found that there was... All of them grew in people that served at a camp. That she said uh, a lot of people don't want their kids to come and work at camps because they're not going to make enough money. And this is talking to a group of camps that pay their people. 
we don't, all of us are volunteers at Florida Bible Camp, so it's even a little harder to get people to come to volunteer for a summer. But she was saying, uh, after researching 600 camp staff, that in the summer, they all grew in those, in those areas. And some of those areas, they grew drastically. There was one thing that took away consistently. So the stats were going up on everyone in all those areas, except for the people who answered highly on um, how much they used a personal technology device. If they used a, the more they used a personal technology device throughout their week, the less they grew. Um, it wasn't necessarily a decline, but it was, you know, rather than pointing way up on the chart, it was, you know, pointing flat or closer to flat. Um, so I think it's interesting that, you know, there's a prayer app, but because I think technology is deterring from some of those, you know, social interactions and things. But I do think in some cases uh, that, it's, that we can use them in good ways. One thing that she said didn't make a difference on the technology is if they were using it for a camp function. So if you know, they're in charge of the PowerPoint or making slides or things like that, then, uh, then it didn't go down. It stayed the same. It didn't count if it wasn't for like, you know, social media and things that, that are more distracting. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. Hopefully you found it interesting. A um, little update, and then I want to kind of close this out with uh, yeah, video and one last, one last uh, couple question things. Our ministry, it isn't always easy, uh, which I, I think sounds obvious, but there's times where it's down, downright depressing. And so I wanted to share, rather than just come and share all the amazing things, uh, that God has done. I wanted to be honest with you guys and share some of the things that have been difficult. The high school Bible study at the local high school, it's, it's rare that we get to do that, for one, to be on the high school campus and share Jesus on a weekly basis. Um, there's a, a larger local school, and some of the youth pastors in the area are involved in that one, and they're only allowed to be there once a month, and they're not allowed to leave it. It has to be student-led. The one that Mitch and I run is... We run it, and we're there weekly and sharing Christ with these kids. So it's really cool that we get to do that. But there's definitely days when I leave and go, why am I doing this? Like, is it, it, Nothing seems to be changing in these kids, right? Um, but I, I know I've talked with Mitch, and, and he's been encouraging, too, on those more difficult weeks of, you know, God's word doesn't return void, right? God's word is important, and it's reaching these kids, whether we notice it or not whether they have uh, good attitudes or not. And several times, you know, I've talked about uh, sharing Jesus with others and, and that uh, caring for others. And I've had students say things like, well, you don't know the people in my class. They're not worth caring for. And it's like, how can you claim to be a Christian and, and think it's not even important to care for others? Like, it's zero importance. Um, anyway, so it's, it's difficult at times. But... Overall, it's, it's a really neat opportunity that we get to be there. And right now, there are um, five students that are struggling with uh, transgender and uh, like alternate lifestyle options. And there, so right now, five that consistently come that are struggling with those sins. And so I think it's awesome that they come weekly, even though uh, they're struggling with those things. They, they have another club that they've started that's all about um, that kind of thing. And it's after school. But they still continue to come to the Bible club. And so if you could pray for those students, if you could pray for the other students, um, even on the weeks when it's difficult and it feels like nobody's listening, there's a couple that listen every week and leave encouraged and ready to share Jesus with their friends. So um, be praying for the students at that Bible study when you think of us. This summer, this coming summer, we have three summer missionaries already, which is, it's kind of early in the year for us to have three. I'm hoping to have about ten um, by the time summer comes around. But right now we have three. And one of those is a guy named Daniel, and he's going to be on the video uh, when, when we play that. He's the last one. But he, uh, he, had a, he had a, he grew up in a Christian school when he was really little, but then he had a rough patch because his mom... Um, and dad divorced, and then his mom got into drugs. And um, he's the oldest of his siblings. And it got to where 
Daniel was taking care of his siblings when his mom was doing whatever she wanted to do outside the home. And um, there was a couple different weeks where she spent her money elsewhere instead of food. And so they wouldn't have food at home. And um, he said that he would, he would go to school and he would get two lunches. And um, on the days where he couldn't help it, he would eat the one. But on a lot of days, he wouldn't eat lunch. And he would save both of them to give to his siblings for dinner. And um, his story breaks my heart. Because it's here in the U.S. and you, you don't hear about things like that very often um, in this land of plenty, you know. And we get a lot of kids that are struggling with things like that. Maybe not that extreme, but at camp you get a wide variety of kids. And it's awesome to get to be uh, a part of their lives uh, reaching kids that, that don't know Jesus. Reaching kids that don't have a Bible in the home. We get a lot of students every summer that don't have Bibles in their home. And we provide Bibles for them. Uh, your church and other churches have, have given us funds over the years to, to make sure that every kid leaves camp with a Bible. Daniel's story, he, uh, he was in that hard time. And uh, in the end, they ended up moving to live with his dad. And he wanted to graduate. It was his senior year. He wanted to graduate the school that he'd gone to his other years. And so he ended up living with our youth pastor, the youth pastor at our church, the church we attend, Cold Springs. And uh, Nick and his wife, Megan, poured into Daniel. And they were a support system for him at a time when he really needed it. And he will tell you that, their, that them pouring into his life you know, was, was the point that made him want to go into youth ministry. And so Daniel wants to be a youth pastor. And after this summer, he's going to Multnomah Bible College. Uh, Multnomah Bible. Is it Multnomah University? It's Multnomah University. Multnomah University in Oregon, and, which is where Nick went, my friend, the youth pastor that, that helped mentor him. And so Daniel wants to be in, in full-time ministry. And along the way, when he was in second grade, he was at Ford Bible Camp as a camper. And then when Nick and Megan brought him back, they brought him back to help serve at camp. And so he's, he's had camp along the way as well. And so he wants to, before he goes away to Bible college, he wants to serve a whole summer as a summer missionary. So one of our summer missionaries is, is Daniel. And um, I, I, his, his story encourages me. I hope, I hope it encourages you. We want, to, uh, we want to be reaching those kids, the kids that need, need God here in the U.S. Um, recently, we had a bike break at camp. And we weren't sure if a pipe broke or what, because we didn't lose all of our water. We just lost water pressure, and it wasn't a lot, but it was... Anyway, so we, uh, we assumed there might be a pipe broken, and we checked around for it, never found it. And one day, Brian, uh, who is him and his wife, Brian and Norma, they live on the property now, and they're uh, basically... They re he retired, and they decided to volunteer full-time. So they live there on the property with us. So they're two of our staff. And Brian was, there's 20 inches of snow on the ground, and Brian's thinking that God's telling him to go for a walk. And he's like, why? Okay, like, like why would I go for, okay, you know, this seems odd. You know, sometimes we, we wonder, too, is this God, or is this just like, what is this? Like, why would I go for a walk in 20 inches of snow? He doesn't really like the snow. In fact, he, he will tell you, he, he's in charge of clearing the snow now, which I'm glad, because I used to be. He's in charge of clearing the snow, and he hates the snow. So he goes, he goes with his dog, and they go for a walk in 20 inches of snow. And they walk out to the ball field, which if you uh, are familiar with the camp, that's a ways. That's walking in the snow for, for a while. So, and he finds the leak. It's spraying all over the ground, and, and it's, he wouldn't have found it without that walk. Anyway, I think it's interesting because God is guiding us. And if we are looking for him, if we're... You know, writing <coughs> notes and taking those that prayer journaling serious, and we're, we'll start to see God working in those situations, because God was working even in telling him to to walk through the snow. Now, I personally, like I've mentioned, really want I want this living water. I want I want it to flow out of me, and I know you guys do too. Um, I want the same for you guys. I want you guys in your church to be a spring up here in, in Arnold, big trees, right? Um, I want your church to be a spring to this community. 
And a couple of things I'm working on doing, and, and I would love it if you guys would join with me, if you're not already, um, reading, reading my Bible daily. I want to read my Bible daily. Um, there, at my church, we use a, their version or Life.Church has a, has a Bible app. It comes back to an app again, I know. Um, you can also read a paper Bible, that works too. But anyway, one thing I like about it, though, is that it, there's some accountability there, because I've got friends on there as well, and um, like I'm going through the New Testament with my buddy Nick. We're both on the same reading plan. I can see the days that he hasn't read, and um, <laughs> he can see the days that I haven't read. So um, there's some accountability there. Anyway, but read our Bible daily. Uh, keeping a prayer journal, like I said, so that we can see God working. We can see those answers to prayer. Uh, I want I, I, I invited my family to join along me. Invite your family to join with you, you know, in that. Reading your Bible daily and, and keeping that prayer journal. One thing I do with my kids now, instead of just praying with them before bed, because I was, I'd make sure that we were reading the Bible, and praying with them before bed, and one thing I do now is on, I'm, I give them a prayer request. I say, all right, Ian, it's your turn to pray for, you know, uh, last night I think you got, it was one of the siblings, huh? I got Maddie. You got Maddie, yeah. So he prayed for Maddie, you know. And um, Maddie got uh, our friend who's a missionary in Cameroon. And so just going through this and keeping track of, of, of God working in these lives. Um, Carissa and I got to see someone in our small group. We're, we're leading a, a parent's small group. And uh, at our church, we just started doing this. It, it had never worked out before to lead a small group because we're 45 minutes from the church. So we drive 45 minutes, and nobody wants to go to our house for a small group. No, it's not a thing to go 45 minutes to a small group. So um, someone at our church who lives a lot closer volunteered their house. So they're going to be the host, and then we're going to help lead the Bible study. And uh, so we just started that. And it came off of a book that we were going through called Spiritual Parenting, uh, putting an emphasis on our parenting, uh, a spiritual emphasis on our parenting. And so after that, we're like, the, the host family and us, we're both like, man, we want to see these families continue to grow closer to each other and closer to God. And so we wanted to do this parenting, uh, a parent's small group. And uh, one thing that, as a family, we want to invite our family along. Because it's important that we do these do uh, spiritual things with God as a family. So I want to encourage you to get your, your families to join with you. At our church, there's a, they, do a, they talk about one more. The, the idea that you would invite one person to church. Invite one person to a special event coming up. Or the, the sandwich day, which I hear is very popular. Right? Sandwich day is very popular. Anyway. Right? You, you guys do sandwich Sandwich Sunday? Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. It's very popular though. Yeah. So invite someone to that. Sounds like it's really good, a lot of fun. Um, invite someone to that. Pray for that one person that you would invite. Pray that they would say yes when you do invite them. Um, I give one more. So as a family, like who are we going to invite as one more? Think about your family, who you can invite to have that one more. And um, I want to pray for you guys before I show you a, a camp video. And I uh, pray that you would be able to do that. God, I thank you for this church. And I thank you for the, the faithful that are here. I thank you uh, that we got to look at your story of Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. And I thank you that we get to be a part of your story. And uh, I pray that you would help us to invite people in. That we would be bold in, in asking people if they could, could join us at church. If they could come to an event. And if we could share the gospel with them, God. I pray that you would help us to look for those opportunities. Um, I thank you that we get to be uh, part of other people's lives, just like you've been a part of ours, God. And I pray that we would be a spring, that this church would be a spring in this community, that you would help them to uh, be bold and, and be gracious. I pray that we would be slow to type, slow to talk, and quick to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's, let's see if I can get this. You said forward one. And then click. This is a family that very quickly adopts you. They take you in and make you a part of the family. One of the things I would say is that many of the young people who are part of Camp Forward, they're in touch with you during the year as well. So it's not just what happens here at camp, but it was, it's what happens. And again, I think this goes back to the family atmosphere that the camp is so good at producing. 
Uh, it's like they're talking to their uncle or someone like that rather than camp director or pastor or, or counselor. You come to serve, but you end up being incredibly strengthened and encouraged and refreshed um, no matter what your role is. So when I was a cab leader at Junior High Boys, I uh, had two campers that were polar opposites in their personalities and uh, rough. And, and on the last night, Pastor Dan had a message on, you know, the gospel and what it means to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And both of them rose their hand and made me realize why I keep coming back. It's a good investment. Um, it's an investment in, in eternal things. So, I mean, that's really, that's the big thing for us. Um, it's just knowing that the investment is something that, that is going to last forever. Even though I grew up in the church, camp was the first place that I realized that Christ really had something in mind for my life, uh, ways in which he wanted me to serve. I needed to own my faith in him. For the kids in church, they get to practice their faith without their parents there, without their family. It does become their own. And then some of these kids have never heard the gospel, and so they're hearing that for the first time. It is, it's more intimate than many other camps. You'll get to know the people you're here with, the volunteers and the campers. You'll get to know them, or at least quite a few of them. I would also say that um, another way in which Ford Bible Camp is unique is the potential for you to serve here in some capacity. That potential is really high at Ford Bible Camp. Um, as much as you can use your gifts and your talents uh, and are willing to uh, be helpful with those and, uh, and serve others with them, you can be used here, uh, so that's unique as well. Usually I'm working with the crew, we do the support role, but I just feel like the, the mission of the camp is something I strongly believe in, and if I can be a support to help uh, kids hear the gospel and hear the implications of the gospel, uh, that's uh, greatly worth it to me. It's a great place to work, I love working uh, under Mitch, and uh, I feel well appreciated. We're all volunteers here, and, and I work alongside a lot of wonderful people that way. Wait a minute, is my hair good? <laughs> okay, good. I came when I was like a little kid in uh, fourth grade, and I always wanted to be a volunteer. So then once I hit high school, I started volunteering at fall camp mainly. This is actually my first summer here, but... Uh, would volunteer at fall camp and do whatever I could to help out. The main thing that draws me back is kind of just being an influence in the kids' lives that are here. I know a couple of kids that go to my church where they went home and their parents came to TJ and were talking about how much they enjoyed camp and talked about all the verses that they memorized and one of them memorized every single verse for the whole week and they were so excited to share every sermon and everything that was said that impacted that. At my church we have a saying <laughs> that um, Happiness is made here and shipped to places like Disneyland and Six Flags. <laughs>